So hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, this session is called A New Dimension of Diversity, Student Veterans in Your Classrooms. Uh, so just a little bit of introduction. My name is Davina Dragana. Um, I was the AE Veteran Civilian Chair and I was also the Civilian Chair at the GW um, Student Veterans Organization and I'm married to a veteran of the Marine Corps. I'm Val Vera and I am the Veteran Services Administrator here at uh, American University and I'm responsible for kind of educating the, the rest of the university on uh, veterans issues and also certifying uh, vet veterans for their VA benefits. Okay. All right, good morning everyone. My name is Chris Evanson. I'm a senior undergraduate at the School of International Service. I'm uh, Christopher Bennett. I'm a undergraduate uh, transfer here in the Veteran Marine Corps. So. Um, so, as you all know, the session description is that we're trying to highlight how veterans can contribute different perspectives to our classroom. Um, we would really like this to be a conversation, so we'd really like to have this be more than a two-way conversation about how faculty see student veterans, how student veterans see faculty. It's, it's more than that, really, because we have many different identities that come into this. We have different prejudices and different ideas, so it's just kind of nice to have an open dialogue and to explore those a little bit further. Um, and one thing that Chris actually raised is just really interesting. Um, so, of course, both of our student veterans are named Chris, so you'll have to forgive me <laughs> a little bit of <laughs> confusion there. But Chris Evanson um, actually raised a very interesting point when we were talking about this, that not all student veterans that we encounter in our classrooms today will have been in theater, right? Like, they would not have been necessarily in Iraq and Afghanistan, whereas Chris has been all over the world. The other Chris Bennett has been all over the world as well during his time. So it's, it is interesting to recognize that there's... Um, there are a lot of things that we might take for granted about a lot of our student veterans, and it would just be helpful to have a few reminders and, and to keep on having this dialogue. So thank you very much for being here, because this is really the first step in having that dialogue. Um, we can also start with just going around the room and mentioning kind of what your interest is, and maybe we can try to tailor the conversation to some of the things you're hoping to get out of the program. So we'll start with you, Ms. Perez. What would you like to do? Oh, just, uh, you know, who you are and what, what your interest is in the group or what you're interested in coming into here to, to talk about or learn. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm Phyllis Perez. I'm, uh, I work in the provost's office. And I'm just really interested in, in finding out um, what some of the issues are, what some of the challenges and, and uh, values are that, that, we can, that we can discuss. Okay. Yeah, I'm Marilyn Goldhauer. I work in CTRL and I also teach in the School of Education. And I'm particularly interested in a more broadening definition of what diversity looks like. I'm helping faculty. CTRL is a position. We do a lot of work for faculty, obviously, to help faculty be more conscious of the fact that we have a more diverse student body and defining diversity in the campus. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, <coughs> Edward Lucas. I'm a PhD candidate at the School of International Service, and I have sort of double-pronged interest in that. I'm both a uh, student veteran of the military um, and also teaching a course that's predominantly uh, active-duty U.S. military personnel. Okay. My name is Ella Rothmiller, and I'm a doctoral student in SIS, and I am um, TA for politics. I'm sure there were students in my class who were veterans. My brother is a veteran. Mm -hmm. And um, just in conversations with my brother and with some other people, I've, um, well, we'll probably get to this later, but um, uh, my brother senses a big difference in maturity levels mm -hmm. and also approach to the material of world politics. Mm -hmm because he's thinking of that in very concrete terms. So um, some of the classroom discussions, I just wonder how how I, as a teacher, can manage classroom discussions that will be interesting to all people given the very wide range of experiences. Um, so that's kind of where I'm coming from. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is David Fletcher. And I work for the School of International Service for Career Advising. And so I'm here to help get a better perspective on what I should be doing to find resources for our veterans, for our future veterans, for our currently student reserve veterans, because there are so many different aspects of career planning and different stages of where our veteran population is in their career. Um, I'm 
I'm Amanda Harrison. I work at the Academic Support and Access Center. Um, so I find myself in a position often trying to advocate on behalf of students, often with faculty, and try to help them see from the student's perspective, often related to disability, and as we know, sometimes you know, veterans with disabilities. So I'm just um, interested in getting more insight. Mm -hmm. Steve Dalzell, I teach in SIS. Uh, on one hand, my classes are ones that often veterans or reserve personnel may choose to take because they're in U.S. defense politics and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, I'm also a retired uh, Army Reserve officer, and so I'm interested in more broadly how I can help veterans and serving military people integrate well and have get the necessary services. And, what we want out of their, what they want out of their experience at AU you know, by being a, a mentor or support person as well. Oh, thank you. And thank you everyone. I mean, it's, this is, I, I'd like us all to begin this conversation by really mm -hmm. considering that we are all the student veteran community. It's, it's not just those who have served, it's everyone that has their best interests at heart and everyone that works with them and tries to kind of broaden that perspective. And I love that I've been hearing that. So thank you all for really being here. Um, okay, so during the session, what do we want to accomplish? We want first to raise the comfort level and the knowledgeability of each one, everyone here, in terms of how they talk about um, their interactions with veterans and, and to really, I guess, have a better view. And we have the benefit of two veterans with us that we can kind of bounce ideas off of and help integrate that conversation. Um, then we'd also like to be able to identify the appropriate resources. So if you do come across a veteran in your classes that are having any questions that you can't answer, we do want to identify the correct resources. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just helpful to get some face-to-face -face time and to know that really, you know, Val puts in so many hours with our veterans. They feel very comfortable with her. She's phenomenal. So it's, it's a good thing to know that she's here, she's interested, she's putting in her time on a, an icy morning to, to be here so that everyone can please refer to her as, as often as they need. And of course, we'd like to give student veterans a voice in what we're doing. So it is difficult being advocates, and, and of course, you know, Val and I are civilians. So it is difficult to really represent, try to represent, or try to represent the best interests of a, a student group that is relatively proportionally smaller than the average student body. So that's why we really do appreciate our Chris's being here today and, and just giving us that voice, because we know it can be a little you know, intimidating, uncomfortable possibly to be on a panel talking about things that they're so, like the time they've so honorably served but maybe don't often talk about in public. So we really appreciate them being here as well. And mm -hmm. um, Professor Sylvia, I, I don't know if you guys want to, we did brief introductions about what we're here and what we hope to get out of it. And it's very like, we're aiming sure. for a conversation type of thing, so go for it. So I'm Steve Sylvia, I teach at <laughs> SIS, and I, I um, direct the, the online Masters in International Relations. And the reason why I'm here is, good share of our students are veterans. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. I'm Judith Singleton, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Anthropology. Mm -hmm. uh, this is my first year at AU, and so last semester in one of my classes I taught, I had a student who was a veteran, and it just, um, I, I had never had a veteran as a student, and for me, it was just um, a very interesting experience and trying to get the student to perhaps use their experience uh, to think about the issues that I talked about in the class. Okay, yeah. Thank you. And not to put you on the spot, but um, <laughs> we just finished a, a round of introductions of people saying who they are and um, what they were hoping to get out of this session. And since I came in late, <laughs> I, I should be on the spot. I apologize for that. No, no. There's an antique show in Katzen, which is like trying to get through that parking lot. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm Celine Marie Pascal. I teach sociology. Um, and I came because there's increasing numbers of veterans in my classes. I think they have an enormous amount to contribute and I'm sometimes challenged to figure out how to access that in a way that enables the group dynamic to really cohere because their life experiences are really different from my other students and I want to find a way to create a synergy where all the veterans feel really welcome, respected and also able to learn a different point of view. Great. Thank you. Okay, great. So again, just to recap our important objectives here, um, increasing our comfort level and knowledgeability discussing these topics, um, identifying appropriate resources and points of contact, and then um, giving our student veterans a voice in all of this. <laughs>
so I guess we'll start with um, these 10, um, 10 starting points from this organization called Hand to Hand Contact and Alison Lighthall. There's lots of resources like this online too if you're interested, but I picked this one because I think it was a pretty comprehensive list of a lot of the things that we might come across today and it'll serve as um, a launch board for this wonderful video that Val is going to show us as well featuring student veterans from our very own campus and then that can kind of segue into our conversation. So the first, um, student veterans are a highly diverse group, as diverse as America itself, and I think we've touched on that a little bit, but not only are the experiences of our student veterans so, so diverse, I mean we have that are veterans that have served in theater, veterans that have served in other capacities, veterans that are, have been in reserves, it's really not uniform in any capacity. So even to say that all veterans are a certain age group, which I mean, as they come into the undergraduate population, generally they would have completed a term of service to technically be a veteran, so they might be at some point a little bit older, but still it's conceivable that you would have, um, like our former president for student veterans, he was 22. So it really that was not as indistinguishable, Andrew Reef. You know, that was not as indistinguishable in terms of a lot of the more mature veterans that we, we kind of see parents and people with the other obligations, a lot of times they can also resemble, you know, the, the other undergraduates to a high degree. Also, of course, this applies across racial and ethnic um, divides and also gender. Of course, we do know that very many um, female service members, and as um, Val will touch on, we also have a fair number of spouses in the community. So that's just something to consider that they are eligible for benefits as well, and Val can talk to that a little bit more. But just to keep in mind that this community is so much larger than what we normally consider. So even though somebody might not present in a way that we might think would be veteran, um, you know, scream veteran to us, like a, a short haircut or, you know, dresses crisply and walks a certain way, it's, it's certainly possible that they could be a part of this group. Um, so then veterans do not see themselves as victims ever. Now keep in mind, I didn't, there are quotation marks here. I did not come up with these phrases, but I think they're interesting conversation points. So. Um, I interpret that one to mean that the asking for assistance in any academic endeavor can be a little bit more challenging. Um, and as we go on to the conversation, it'll be interesting to hear what our veterans think, but um, from a military culture, it's, it's a little bit different, and I'm sure, please guys jump in if you ever want to, but um, it's a little bit different than, so the, the change in mindset from having an assignment given to you and then not necessarily having a focus beyond group work. I know Chris, um, had a few challenges, Chris Bennett, excuse me, <laughs> but Chris Bennett had a few um, challenges getting undergraduates who wanted to create these, like, the synergy through these small gr working groups, that it wasn't necessarily the same um, climate for a student veteran because they weren't living in the same dorms. They didn't have these natural relationships that they could make, and I'm sure that's the case with online courses as well, that um, there's, it, we do have to go a little bit further in trying to foster an environment where those groups can be made, where we can have that cohesive, you know, mentality, and it's it's going to be a little bit different, particularly for veterans that do have a different level of maturity, a different level of responsibility towards their work, perhaps, than some of the other undergraduates they might have to work with, and that goes both ways, of course. That, that can be an isolating factor for not just the undergraduates, but also for the veterans who may not want to be taking on a burden that, you know, they might seem, I mean, they might feel is disproportionate. Also, um, just in my capacity from working with, vet, with the student veterans groups and tutoring, um, that is something that I think is, I, I don't think it can be overstated that we do need to be a little bit more proactive in offering tools and assistance and writing centers and making that knowledge readily available. Um, it's, I think there's something about student veterans feeling that they should be able to make this transition easily, that they see younger students being able to do this, and it's a different set of skills. So just being sensitive to the fact that you know, writing a paper is going to be a little bit different than maybe some of the organizational things they might have had to do in their career in the military, like writing memos. I know um, I actually met my husband at um, the GW Veterans Group when we were both undergrads, and I met him first by tutoring, and um, that was something we had a really big challenge with, because it took him a very long time, and this is anecdotal, of course, but I, I feel most comfortable talking about my experiences with him. So. Um, he, when we first started working, he would have so many great ideas, like really wonderful ideas, but getting them onto paper was incredibly painful, and it took me a very long time to understand why that was, and it was only from hours, and I'm not saying everyone here should go put in hours to do this, but just to give you an idea of where this particular issue was coming from, um, he wanted every sentence to be perfect the first time he wrote it, so this was causing hours and hours to come up with a draft for like a five-page paper. 
And it took a lot of time for him to feel comfortable just getting ideas out there in an imperfect form and then editing it afterwards. So I imagine that maybe he explained that in his career he had been used to kind of writing very short bursts of writing and having that luxury of spending the time making sure each word was perfect and not necessarily spending as much time editing it back. But of course, as we know, writing a long-term paper, that's a very difficult task to undertake. And it really was very frustrating for him as well because he was seeing his his you know, counterparts in classes finishing these papers without all of this, you know, hullabaloo over which word was placed where. So it was very challenging for him. So just as an idea to kind of consider some of the things that might be causing a, a bit of a disconnect in terms of frustration levels and assignments, it's, it's, it's something that, you know, will be unique to every veteran. Everyone's going to have their own experiences, but it's something to consider that it's going to be a little bit different. See, you know, I, if, if I can interrupt please, you please. for a moment, one of the other issues with this is it's not just um, a comfort level but also the fact that from where they're coming from, asking for help can be perceived as a weakness mm -hmm. and they are discouraged from asking for help. And so um, that has been, that's been an issue from the beginning here at the university, how to get help to them when they don't want to say that they need help. And what we've done this past year is we, um, we, we offered workshops from the Academic Support Center and nobody came except for one. <laughs> and he went to all the workshops and he loved them and he thought they were the most interesting things he had taken and found them very useful. And so the Academic, academic Support and Access Thank you, it's changed. <laughs> and Access Center um, hired him and made him a veteran mentor. Mm -hmm. And so he now works with all his brothers and sisters from the service. And they come in, they're much more comfortable with him. Um, any opportunity he has to be somewhere, any event, he's there. And we had a, we had a kind of pizza get together just to, just to have, you know, just to say hello for the semester in the fall. And in the course of the conversation there, and it took a long time for this to come up, one of the vets said, you know, this SPSS is really kicking my butt. <laughs> like that. And so Brent said, I know how to do that. And I can help you with that. And the conversation completely switched, shifted over to that. So it went from being a deficiency to being just a, you know, this is what people in class talk about. You know, I, I don't know how to use this damn thing. How do I get to use it? And that has been a very, very, that comes from best practices. It wasn't our, that wasn't our idea, but we, we grabbed it. And, it. and each semester now, I mean, this next semester, he's just really refining what he's doing. And of course, we now have a veteran's lounge where he has a place where he can do this and everything. So that is, that's something for, I think, faculty to consider. You may not be able to know who is in your classroom. You may not know, you know, you may not know who your vets are, but, you know, you can access this veteran's mentor and let him know, especially if there's something that you would like, you know, or that you can give him to help his fellow vets and stuff like that. But anyway, I'm yeah. sorry. No, 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 I no, no please, I'm, I'm so happy. Then please interject at any point mm -hmm. if you have any questions. And so what do you, what do you guys think about asking for help in a classroom? Is it intimidating? Is it difficult to? I don't know, like for me, like I don't have <laughs> a problem as much. Like I'm, I'm a hands-on person. Uh, I'm kind of a slow learner, but Everything I learn hands-on, like I seem to remember, but it takes me a little bit, a little bit longer to really grasp what, what you're, what's being taught. So I try to get uh, small groups going, and that was kind of my problem last semester. Was everyone kind of has their subgroups? They're all you know freshmen or whatever, and I'm a transfer <laughs> student, so I'm a little older, so I don't really know many people. So I had a problem getting those study groups going, you know. But there's like different types of veterans. Some some veterans have you know families and maybe they're not more into that stuff. Then you have people like me. It's like the Lone Ranger. Like I'm just <laughs> I'm here. And I'm just, I'm ready to do whatever it takes to kind of get to the next step, you know. Because I feel like I have you know 
I, I feel like I'm here and I'm trying to beat time, you know, to make up for lost time. So there's just like two kind of different uh, views, I guess. But I'm, I don't have a problem asking for help. Um, but I do see like a lot of veterans are really hard headed. <laughs> so it may be like, well, I'm smarter than this, you know, this punk 18 year old. Why am I not getting this? So they may be like real hesitant about that. So I can kind of see where that's coming from because I know a lot of people like that as well. So that made any sense. So Thank you. All. If I could add to that, if you think back to our service in the military, the, the military is a very vertical organization. So as you're moving up the chain of command, and every time one is promoted or advanced in the rank, um, you're always looking upwards. It's not really a design. It's not designed to where if you're say in a mid uh, position, a mid-level position, where you ask down for help. Mm -hmm. So think about that for a second. So I, you know, a little bit about me. I'm 31. I served uh, 11 years on active duty from 2001 to 2012, and I'm in the reserves now. But uh, I, I had success in, in advancing up the rank, and there's expectations that when you attain those certain positions, you become a leader. Um, and then those under you are supposed to learn from you, and you're supposed to take them under your wing and eventually put them in a position to where they will replace you once you leave. And that's the, the mechanism of how the military works. It's that old, it's that old story when, when you fall and the flag drops, who's there to pick it up behind you? And when you come to an academic environment, um, I'm 10, 11, 12 years older than my peers who were 9, 10, 11 years old when I joined the military. And so it can be incredibly daunting and intimidating to go down and, and asking down the quote unquote chain of command, if you will, for help. Um, and Mr. It's Delville, Professor Delville? Delville. Delville. Um, he said something that I think is really critical to the student veterans on campus in terms of mentorship. In the military, it's all about mentorship. Somebody sees in you a, a potential type of leadership or a potential type of skill set, and they take you under their wing and they mentor you. I think here on the campus, um, they've done a lot of great things to in providing avenues for um, certain types of workshops and, and lounges, but I think what we really need, in my opinion, is a professor to be the mentor to that student, to say, I'm going to take you under the wing and, and show you what it means to be a true academic, to be a true scholar, how to ask questions. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to, to office hours and felt incredibly awkward because I don't know the questions to ask. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes, there's something to think about that. Veterans want to be here. You know, AU didn't really go out and proactively engage and try to recruit veterans. I think every veteran that is here did their own research, did their own application on their own accord and said, I want to be a student at American University. I want to study in Washington, D.C. And so AU was then in a position now, okay, we've got this good crop of students, all veterans, and what do we do now? And I think we're in a very fluid kind of stage right now with how do we transition from point A to point B? Now, so veterans want help. I, I think it's a matter of do they know how to ask for it? Do they know the questions to ask? Um, and so for me, I'm a father. I have a 21-month-old baby girl. I have a wife. And I have all these expectations outside of the school. But when I'm on here, I really want to do well, and it frustrates me when I don't feel I'm achieving the degree of success that I hope to achieve. achieve. But and so in terms of what we need, in my opinion, um, we really need those mentors to say, okay, I see you. How do we, let me work with you, let me take you by the, the hand, so to speak, and kind of walk you through that. And so I think that's really, uh, really critical. Thank you. I'd like to respond to this a little bit. Yeah. So <laughs> see me as a teacher in the classroom. Right. Okay. Um, I've had some discussions with my brother, who's a veteran. Uh -huh. I don't know how generalizable this is, but I want to kind of throw this out there and right. get your response. So <clears throat> for me, thinking about me mentoring someone else mm -hmm. seems a little bit daunting and intimidating for the following reasons. Um, so I was studying for my comprehensive exam in international peace and conflict resolution. Mm -hmm and talking to my brother who had been deployed twice in Iraq and twice in Afghanistan and who has his own opinions about that and does a lot of reading on the side, very knowledgeable. Right. So I'm thinking, great person to talk to. He's thinking, I'll talk to Ella because she's been reading all this stuff and maybe I can figure out which 5% is going to be worthwhile for me. Mm -hmm. So anyway, one 
thing we had to work through in our relationship is kind of establishing respect for our different experiences because from his point of view, I absolutely do not have street cred. I mean, <laughs> I would be the first person to die in combat, no questions asked. Like, I have no survival skills. Right. It's a miracle I can drive to work without getting hit by a car. It's just like, <laughs> that's just not me. And, you know, from my perspective, I can see his point and I want to learn from his experience, but also from my perspective, I've been reading a lot of smart people who mm -hmm. also have lots of experience, mm -hmm. and I've been thinking about these things and studying these things and talking to a lot of different people for a very long time. Right. So <coughs> I think, I guess the challenge for me is, <coughs> The chat, so we have kind of this background. And so like for me to think that I'm gonna mentor someone else, my insecurity comes from not having that military experience when I'm thinking, well, it's running through other people's heads that really mm -hmm. if I don't have that, nothing I say really counts. Right. Mm -hmm. can, can I respond to that? <laughs> 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 and, and thank you for making the suggestion in terms of mentoring. Mm -hmm. Because this particular student, I have been thinking about reaching out to mentor him. And I have absolutely no background in the military. No one in my family was in the military. But I look at it as um, it's a dialectic. Mm -hmm. uh, I can learn a lot from him mm -hmm. as much as he can learn from me. And, and I, you know, would certainly like to know because when I teach and putting together my course syllabus and materials, you know, I'm thinking the traditional undergraduate student, 18 to 21. And so, you know, I need to know what I'm talking about. Do you relate to that? Mm -hmm. Is this class speaking to you mm -hmm. in any way. <laughs> and I really need to know that. And I need to know that from students who come from all different kinds of backgrounds, including, right, veterans. Uh, that's the challenge for me, is to make it um, relatable to everybody. I think, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think real quick out there. Uh, a great way to approach um, kind of that problem when you're when you're dealing with kind of because like I said a lot of veterans are hard-headed that's just the way they are um, but a great way to approach the mentoring way of it is being like you know I have a lot to teach and but like letting them know like you have a lot to learn from them even even maybe you're like you know this guy he's an idiot but he's a veteran but the only way to get to him is like you know making him feel important because they don't feel important anymore because they did their thing now they're back at, at, at college and that's where the disconnect comes you know they don't feel important they're not what they were they're not running out you know doing whatever their job was so the best way to approach something like that is be like I have a lot to teach you but I also have a lot to learn from you. and that's really going to open up I think so that kind of helps on the whole mentor thing and if I could uh, address a question that you asked You've seen this a lot in the military. We go to all these military schools within the military to learn various trades and various aspects. And then it's not uncommon where you return back to a unit and someone says, everything you just learned there, forget it. Because this oh. is how we really do things here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's kind of a real world approach to theory, if you will. <laughs> Us military veterans tend to be on this backwards approach. So the traditional demographic of students at 18 to 22, 23 demographic are fresh out of high school. We're preparing them in theory the various fundamentals of whatever trade that they're learning. And then when they go out into the real world, they're going to apply what they learn and expand upon. That's the idea, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, we did it backwards. We went out and did the application of reality. And now we're coming to the academic environment and learning that. And so we may see, oh, that's a whole, that's BS, that doesn't work, or this or that, and maybe try to pick fights with it. Um, but that doesn't mean that what you have is not a value to that individual. I think it's all about our approach. Mm -hmm. So maybe for you, as a student, as well as a scholar, because we're never done being a scholar, right? <laughs> maybe if you posed the questions of like, 
I've read articles written by these people. These are very sharp intellectuals, and they say in these environments this is the approach to take. Well, you've been there. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. Can that work in that environment? Or maybe pose questions such as, well, I see where you're coming from, but have you considered thinking from this perspective? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. any fight I've ever had in my life, it's all about seeing things from her point of view. <laughs> I think the key is, is, is empathy, is trying to get that other person to see things, or trying to see things from their perspective. Mm -hmm. And then if you see things from their perspective, maybe framing your questions or maybe how you teach something to that, and then it become this symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. Now on the flip side of that, you're a PhD student, eventual full-time assistant professor, you've developed some strategies of success in terms of how to actually write and, and be an academic, which has nothing to do with whatever real-world knowledge we have. And that's, I think, where your value definitely comes in. One of my frustrations, I've been here three full semesters, I've yet to get an A. I've gotten six B pluses, straight Bs. So I have this joke, I should be a honey salesman because I know how to cultivate bees. <laughs> <laughs> and so, as Chris will tell you, um, Nothing was ever handed to us in the military. Every rank we've ever earned was through a lot of hard work, was through a lot of, <laughs> you know, and those reservists in the room know what we're talking about. And so there's an expectation of, of success that we, we approach to everything. My very first unit, our core model, our core, uh, our core values were pride, poise, perfection. And so coming here and bees to us are mediocrity, then I'll be talking to people that are they're like, yeah, you go to a top 10 higher school, bees are good. And we're not happy with that answer. And then we'll go to office hours being like, how do I, what am I doing wrong? How am I writing better? Or how can I write better? And some professors will give you kind of like what comes across to us as shtick. Mm -hmm. Okay, some professors may be more willing to sit down with you. And so that's where that mentorship comes in. And then factoring the fact is maybe it is a success of mine that I've gotten bees while also having to pick up my daughter from daycare every day at 6.30 and getting yelled at for the wife if I haven't done this or that. <laughs> I'm driving through this DC traffic every day. And, <laughs> and so we, we have a lot of different things that are pulling and tugging at us in your traditional student that lives at Litz Anderson or Castle Hall. Um, and so I don't know if I made any yeah, sense there. Thank you. I, th I think you have to understand also that you have so much to impart. You have so much to impart in addition to your academic subject, just you've lived long enough to impart something <laughs> to somebody. I mean, that's how I, that's how I look at this. Um, I am, as far as I'm concerned, I am their pathway to understanding leaving one bureaucracy and coming <laughs> into another. You know, I'm here to let them know that I'm going to help you get what you want. I'm going to show you how you get what you want, not just here at the university, but anywhere. You know, what you have to prepare, how you go after it, what your expectations should be for how long it's going to take to make that happen and stuff, and how reasonable you should be, and how you present what you're looking for and stuff like that, because I've tried to do that long enough that I know how to do that. And then you have, you know, on top of that, I'm you have the language barrier. I don't, I'm not talking about missions and combat and, you know, and, uh, and commanding officers and all the things that go along with it. So you have to, you have to speak languages. You have to, you have to move from one thing to another all the way through. But there are, you know, I, I just think that um, they're hungry in a way that other students are not hungry. You know, I, I, you know, that, that, just let me finish one more thing. You, you represent to them in your classroom, you represent an expert in whatever thing you're an expert in. So they're coming in going, when I have this professor, I want to know everything that you can possibly tell me. Please help me. Not, not, not what the book says, not what the slides say, not what I can learn in an online course, but you personally, I want to know what you have to teach me. And that can be very daunting for a professor who has a whole room full of people that probably would like to be, you know, draining your brain to figure out what's taken you a lifetime to learn. But I think that's the expectation. I want, I want to know what, like, what is it special that you have that you want to tell me, you know? I just want to add one more thing to what you were saying. Um, and thank you, Ms. Barry. 
Uh, we're trained from day one to be leaders in the military. That's kind of the way the, the business works. And there's two types of power and leadership that I was learned. There's position power and there's personal power. By virtue of you being an academic instructor, you have position power by virtue that you control their grades. So therefore, we would be um, um, subservient to you in that sense. Mm -hmm. Then there's personal power, which is the power that you gain because we respect you. Mm -hmm. And so if we sense in a, a particular leader, um, like you said, you may be unconfident approaching that person because maybe you're not comfortable with what you're telling him or her, that's going to be received loud and clear. And then it's going to be very difficult from, from that point forward for us to kind of you lose credibility in that sense if you don't feel that you have a full confidence and grasp of what you're trying to teach us. So I think that's the start. Because if you have, if you're firmly entrenched in, in what you're espousing, mm -hmm. then we buy into that. It has nothing to do with whether or not you have that practical experience. It matters if you have conviction in what you're teaching us. And we've had classes here, and he and I mentioned briefly, where we can tell when a professor comes to class and they're unprepared. We can tell when a professor fully doesn't have a grasp of what they're teaching. And we tune that out. And you've lost us for that entire semester. So just think about that. Um, you can teach us basket weaving. It doesn't matter. We'll respect you. But at the end of the day, do you have confidence? And are you um, competent? And from that perspective, then you have us. And then you have us wrapped around your finger. And then we're going to come to you for more. We want to learn more and more and more. So if that makes sense. I think that's a, a very. You've been raising yeah, your hand all day. Okay. <laughs> so much of this, looking at these uh, things you put up here, really apply also to many of our international students. Of course. Mm. So some of our mm -hmm. students, older just students, or students who have not gone say. to college four years or more, or taken time off, or whatever. And I think so much of it is because of the universal design, which is for the academic support. So I have a new baby over there. <laughs> talks about is a session this afternoon. I'm doing a session this afternoon on differentiated instruction. I mean, the idea is that the needs that, that student veterans have are very similar to what good teaching is all about. In other words, some of the things she was talking about of, of understand, finding out who your students are, what they need, realizing that not all students need the same instruction. Here's, here's a question that I still struggle with because I do a lot of this in the class trying to get all of my students to realize it's a partnership. That, you know, it's not all about me, it's about students, and I need to know what's happening. And I always tell my students day one, the only thing that will upset me is waiting until the end of the semester to tell me about something that didn't work. So what can I, what can I do mm -hmm. when the course is over if you say, you know, if you presented it this way, it would have been so much more helpful. So <laughs> any advice that you have for us about how to encourage student veterans who are used to a, a fairly regimented, like you say, leadership pattern, to say to them, tell me um, what would you, tell me what works, what your learning style is like, what, you know, what makes sense to you, what doesn't, that this is a partnership that, I mean, I try to get assignments where students have to write things that give me some clue about what matters to them, but um, I don't believe I've ever had a veteran in my class. No one's identified. I had one student in ROTC, but he was a more traditional undergrad student. Mm -hmm. So how do we how do we encourage this particular population to um, be willing to talk about what they need? Well, just uh, I just you said you you don't know if you've ever had a veteran. Um, keep in mind that the only one percent of the American population at a given point actually serves in uniform, but that one percent is awfully reflective of the American mm -hmm. body mm -hmm. in general. You come in different shapes and sizes. You may have had veterans, but just never knew it. And so maybe you could just employ something as a simple survey at the beginning of the semester just to learn about all your students and maybe put in something, are you a veteran? Mm -hmm. So therefore, you know um, who your kind of how diverse your group is from the beginning. Because we don't, a lot of us, a lot of us look at it as our past military services. We've been there, we've done that, now we're moving on. We're trying to reinvent ourselves. That was chapter one of our life story. Now we're at school, chapter two, three, et cetera. And so we don't really see a need to necessarily vocalize. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I t uh, tend to stay in the shadows when it comes to <laughs> veterans. Mm -hmm. um, this is probably the first like veteran association thing I've really done. Um, that's not I don't like I don't know it's hard to explain like I'm I see a lot of veterans that are like gimme gimme gimme. Not all of them are like that. But there's a large portion that do, 
And so I kind of take that offensive, so I just don't even associate myself sometimes. Mm -hmm. So you have those people that are trying to let you know that they're a veteran, and you have those people that are really just trying to get to the next level. You know? Can you share with them about what being gray means? What do you mean? Like when you, when you go to training and you went to boot camp, they said just be the gray guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, so a little about me, like, I was uh, I was in force reconnaissance, so we have, um, it's a it's a job in the infantry, and it's, it's pretty advanced when it comes to training, so we go through schools after school after school, and one of the, the things, like, we go through jump school, dive school, sniper school, stuff like that, so one of the biggest things is not to be the person that the instructors know through every school. Just be great, man. So it's, it's kind of like you want to be there, you want to do good, but you're, you're just right there at the top, not really, you know, everyone doesn't know you by first name. It's normally a good thing. So that's the kind of the concept we take into school is we're there. Um, maybe we just, you know, want to get through the class and learn as much as we, you know, want to know. You may not even know we're there. So there's, there's a couple of people that are, you know, you might run into kind of like that. So it's kind of not be seen and not heard, but you're there. Mm -hmm. And we all yeah. have old habits are hard to break, so we come to the <laughs> academic environment we're much the same way. Yeah. Our end goal is to get that degree and move up to the next phase of our life. And, and, and this is but try problem. to do it invisibly. Yeah, this is, a, this is the problem. What you're mentioning is the problem. because, And, I, and I, I'm trying to be careful because the reason I made this video is that I don't want to speak for the veterans. I want them to speak directly to you so you can hear some of these things. Um, but we have an extremely, extremely liberal campus, <laughs> to say the least. Not just, not just the student body, but the faculty. And so to ask a veteran to, excuse me, out himself <laughs> in your classroom before he knows how he's going to be received mm -hmm. or she is going to be received is very, very difficult. They like to find out what the lay of the land is before they do that. And how you create an environment in your classroom where they feel safe enough and want to tell you um, is a whole different, you know, a whole different game. I've had people say, can we call you? Can we call you Val and can you tell us who's in our classroom? And I said, no. <laughs> I can't do that, you know, I can't do that. But I have a feeling that, first of all, I think it's easy for any professor who has been in the service to somehow get that out, you know, and let them, let them know that they've got, they've got someone in there that's, that is, has a connection to them. But for those people that have not been in the service, there must be something else that can be said. That can that can make it an environment that is. Yeah, right. Because it's referred to because I teach medicare and background is in the development. You refer to it as a pro-social environment. Mm -hmm. You want all students to feel that they have a voice, that the things they mm -hmm. do is important, that diverse perspectives are valued, mm -hmm. and not everybody takes a liberal view. And there's going to be difficult conversations have to be done respectfully. Mm -hmm. um, that everyone needs different things. Mm -hmm. So that I think if you create those kinds of environments, mm -hmm. I would hope that students. I had one vet come, come in the other day and said, you know, after this wonderful conversation in class, you know, um, the question was, does everybody in this class um, identify themselves as a feminist? And he said, and I, and I said, no. And he said, he said, I thought I might be stoned. He said, it was, he said, it was crazy. And he said, you know, and I was sitting there, he said, I didn't want to. I'd be crazy defending myself. He said, I have a wife that would tell you tomorrow, you know, that I am someone who supports all these things for women and that I want them to do this and that. But the question was, do you identify yourself as a feminist? And actually, I don't. 
He said, I was just answering it honestly. He said, I thought that people were, you know, he said, I thought that smoke was going to come out of there <laughs> all the way through. And he said, it was just an indication to me of, you know, how hard it is not to have a, um, a kind of universal, you know, a universally accepted, you know, opinion here on campus all the way through. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm really interested and perplexed the conversation yeah. unfolding. So um, <laughs> in, in my in my classrooms, of course, when things like labels like feminist yeah. are unclear, mm -hmm. right? But if, if it's about uh, equality, if you can mm -hmm. say what that means, then people have a way of stepping in and Definitely. debating it, mm -hmm. right? Um, what I find really challenging, and I was a non-traditional student myself all the way through. Um, I am used to being the out-of-the-box person who thought really, I worked really hard to figure out what was happening up there. So now I'm looking the other way. And in my classrooms, I really encourage a lot of conversation, a lot of debate. And probably among veterans, the second most growing population in my classroom are transgendered men and women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really, when we talk about making a safe space for everyone, there has to be a way to really make it inclusive. And so uh, the thing, I have a brother, maybe like yours, own, my brother is completely insane. <laughs> <laughs> we have these conversations all the time where we're like, I can't even believe it, I'm related to him, but I try to see from his point of view because He's a thinking, intelligent being, and we have really different views, so we leave it at places where we go, well, we're just not going to agree on this, mm -hmm. okay? But then there's still all these other places where we connect. And I don't know quite how to build that in the classroom, where somebody, um, in, in the course of this conversation, I've heard things in this room that my students would have called out as sexist, mm -hmm. off the bat. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody here meant anything to be sexist. Mm -hmm. right? So how do we have those conversations without alienating veterans? I want to bring veterans into my classroom. I want a place for everybody, but I don't want bringing them in to push out students who are also dealing with really different social locations as well. So what can I do? Well, I would just suggest trying to be, as, as like a moderator in a class when it comes to discussion, trying to be the most like ind independent politically as you can. Um, I'm really big on independence in, in, in uh, politics. And if I, when, anytime I see like a, a, a professor that kind of is biased either way, it, and like, you know, because you can really learn a lot from your class if the teacher is independent when it comes to politics. Because people are so alike. It doesn't matter what pol you know, political party you affiliate with. Everyone is so much alike. They just don't realize it as soon as you associate yourself with a political party. Then that wall goes up. So being like the moderator that's in the middle, for the most part, will really go a long way in terms of um, having those two, you know, the transgender and then the, the you know, something to do with the military. So, because those, those really, you know, hit heads a lot, especially right now with everything that's been going on with the military and stuff like that. So being kind of the middle person and not affiliating with either side will really take you a long way. Because one of the problems uh, I've heard from a couple veterans is like, well, I go into a class and I just feel like it's so, so one-sided, I just don't even want to say anything. Mm -hmm. So that may be one of the problems. But it's really just on the individual too, you know. Mm -hmm. that, that may help. Or maybe bringing together what the, what the transgendered person and the veteran have in common in terms of struggle. Because I think there are some commonalities. Yeah. And the best thing to do, too, is letting the students debate mm -hmm. and then letting, just kind of letting them debate it. Because mm -hmm. then whenever a teacher kind of sides with something, I mean, other than putting, like, the intellectual part, like, hey, well, let's do this view on this side and this view on this mm -hmm. side. As soon as you side, you're going to throw that wall up to either one of them. Mm -hmm. You know? And I think it's pretty easy to, I mean, at least I can, you know, I, I got my graduate degree here. And I think I was pretty aware of how my professors felt and thought <laughs> about a lot of things when I was in classroom. And so um, had I had issues, 
you know, or had I been concerned about authority or how I was going to be graded, that would have been, uh, well, I, I can't say that because the truth of the matter is it wouldn't have stopped me in any way. But, <laughs> but I mean, it, it, I think it, it, can, it can discourage somebody coming in. You know, it's one thing if your classmate doesn't agree with you. It's another thing if your professor doesn't. If I could add on what everybody's saying, um, a few years ago, my, uh, my command paid for a bunch of the people I worked with. We went to one of those big speaker series. Um, we're all like the political types. When they retire, leave office, they go on all these junkets around the country. <laughs> and um, nice yeah, they get paid. Yeah, <laughs> to learn about their, you know, I had Rudy Giuliani preaching about IT, and I'm like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> like, what's going on here? <laughs> but there's there's this motivational guy. This is this Pakistani guy who came here when he was 18 to go to school, and he had he was your traditional $500 in his pocket, life savings, and came here. And now he's a multimillionaire. But he said something I'll never forget. He says the true weapon of mass destruction is political correctness. Hmm. And I think what does that mean in the in the classroom setting? I think the first part is coming to the classroom with the expectation is you're not going to please everybody. So once you accept that viewpoint. As long as you provide an atmosphere where everybody can say whatever they feel, it's an open society, um, and your viewpoints are respected, and we're not going to criticize you just because you have a different viewpoint from the other person. That's unrealistic in society, but in the classroom, I think we can do that. You just need to turn on the TV, and everything in this society today is all about divisiveness. You have Pat Robertson on, on uh, what's that show called? Uh, the Duck <laughs> Dynasty uh, <laughs> has a certain few points about homosexuals and it goes viral and all it's all of a sudden about people picking sides are you with them or are you against them you know whether you're an LGBT student whether you're this or that a veteran etc it's all about picking sides and then you attack the other person I think in the classroom setting is if you set it's all about the, the te it's all about um, the foundation you set from the beginning it's like raising my daughter. We have to set a firm fundamental foundation of what <laughs> line she can cross and what line she can't. And uh, we learn that every day. And I think in the classroom, <laughs> if you provide the, the climate, that's a big word used in the military, climate. What type of work climate do you have? If you have a classroom climate where people, we need to be better listeners too. I can't tell you how many times where I, I would talk all the time and when I actually shut up and I listen, I'm like, wow, that's actually, a, <laughs> never thought about it, mind blown. So I think if we create that type of atmosphere, we could do um, a lot better. I mean, we're never going to please everybody, but I think it's just all about the climate that we set. I'll never forget I was at a community college before I came here, and we saw this, this, this news article in this political science class I got where this woman who lived in this predominantly African-American neighborhood decided to ra raise the Dixie flag in the neighborhood. And all the, my class was predominantly African-American, and my professor was African-American. And in this video, a news clip, all the African Americans within the uh, within the community came and they were yelling at her and they were making this big shitstorm in the neighborhood. <laughs> I proposed just a, a, a viewpoint, a theoretical viewpoint. I'm like, I don't agree with her raising that flag because it's going to cause torment and cause issues. But are not the people that are yelling, or are they not perpetuating the issue themselves? What if they said nothing and they just went about their business? Is she not rendered mute at that point and then she feels like kind of like an idiot? <laughs> or the cause that she was trying to inflict is no longer relevant. And so I think if we just have an atmosphere where we, we listen to people, we have certain guidelines, I think that's the best we can do. Edward, did you have something? I'm going to grab you for coffee, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, no, I just want to really interesting this question. I just wanted to bring up, um, I think it was actually point number 10. Um, well, you mentioned at the beginning about the diversity of veterans, and uh, I kind of one thing I think that's missing there is actually that our veteran body is more diverse than America because we're leaving out the idea that there are uh, veterans of other military. So I said I spent mm -hmm. 10 years as a mili in the military, but I didn't say which one, and actually it was not the U.S. and the Canadian military. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of, say, South Korean students. Uh, yeah. Any men that are South mm -hmm. Korean, they're all veterans pretty much. Uh, and and Israeli students and other mm -hmm. Ones. And while you know VA benefits and stuff don't apply to us, uh, other things more broadly Absolutely do. Apply. Um, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. The other way that there's a bit more diversity than we might have been focusing on here um, is some veterans come in that already have um, quite a bit of academic training mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe they were at military academies um, or they, they went through ROTC or whatever. So they have. Um, experience in the academic realm 
Um, you know, uh, so that's another way that there can, there's more diversity than we've sort of been focusing on here. Mm -hmm. And finally, I really like the point that was brought up in the beginning about uh, not all, the term veteran, I think, has been broadened. It used to mm -hmm. mean people that were actually in combat. Um, yeah. It's my understanding, like World War II vets or guys who mm -hmm. were, you know, in Omaha Beach or whatever. Um, and now it's, it's broader, which is fine. I'm not arguing that it shouldn't be. Um, but even being in theater um, can mean different things. So Chris mm -hmm. Bennett, you said you know you had this very um, kinetic role, should we say, <laughs> yeah. that yeah. um, Right. So being in theater for you and being in theater for me, who was serving on board a you know a destroyer in the middle of the ocean, uh, are two you know, undoubtedly two very different experiences. Um, and so just assuming that. You know, if a veteran has been in a, you know, a forward air, whatever term you want to use, it can be mean ex completely, completely uh, different experiences. Yeah, can I just quickly add, it's a great, great point. Keep in mind that everybody that wears a uniform serves the cause. We serve the king. You know? mm -hmm. We serve the United States of America. We all serve in different capacities. And there's five services in the armed services. And I may not really understand Chris because he was in the Marine Corps, and he may not understand me because I was in the Coast Guard, right? <laughs> when you're in uniform, you know, people make jokes about services. You have all these service rivalries, but everybody has their own unique role. And we're only 1%, generally speaking, of the population serves in uniform. A smaller percentage, like Chris, actually actually serve in the frontline combat roles. The majority of military veterans serve in a more of a support-based role. So I think we run a, a, a challenge if we try to cookie-cutter veterans right. mm -hmm. and right. no two veterans are the same and so how how do you differentiate between veteran A and veteran B and I think right. that's where the challenge is. And I don't want to muddy this any more <laughs> than, it, than it gets muddy but just short of half our military population are dependents of military which is not something that I really concerned myself with in the beginning when I took over this responsibility other than getting them their, their benefits until I started to understand that many of the issues that veterans have applied to their families mm -hmm. and that they um, and that a, um, a child of, a, um, of an active duty service member who is sitting in your classroom and hearing things that are anti-military or you know or disrespectful to the military are having um, similar problems as a vet that's sitting in the classroom, you know, um, and and they're maybe more hidden than the vet themselves. So there, you know, we have we have now as of last as of last semester we have 303 uh, people receiving benefits here. That's the only way I can know, and uh, about 120 of them are dependents also. But I just, you know, I mean, it's a very diverse community. I and mean, most of the awesome. membership of the student veterans group is actually dependents and mm -hmm. military family members. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is, that's where we are seeing a huge presence and how impactful it's going to be on our campus. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess we actually we are running close. Thing. Yeah, so we do want to get to <laughs> Val's video. So I'm, sh I'm sure you guys were able yeah. to just did, read. Did like you have <laughs> a question you raised your hand? Oh, yeah, about, about the mentorship, I believe. Was it during that? Something that was going to keep going. Okay. Well, the, the video is good. <laughs> and I think the video, the vets will answer agree. a lot of your questions that you have. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we all agree, I assume, that student veterans are greatest. We <laughs> um, that's why we're here. And then we can come back to this after the video. So it's just um, um, it, no, it's yeah. yeah, it's for the military. Everything's six days in the morning. You wake up, you know, you brush your teeth, shave, you go to work, and they tell you when to go home. It's very structured. Now you have all this freedom in the world, and you can choose to do pretty much anything you want, but that's at the expense of your homework at this point. Then I really feel talking with the Active Support Center, kind of giving me a budget my time, how to budget my time, and use my time wisely. I felt that I wasn't up to speed at all coming back after 10 years and meeting with the Academic Support, the Active Center, mm -hmm. teaching about <laughs> endo, teaching how to do research. I didn't have that faculty, you know, to, to be able to come here and do that. I needed to learn that, and I needed to learn it really fast, because when you don't even know what a lit review is, and one's assigned in two weeks, you don't have much time to figure out, you know, what you're going to do about that, so you definitely need to seek support wherever you can. I was undergrad at Naval Academy, so people would stand up, professors were called sir, they were called instructors, there was no banter, there wasn't 
challenging those ideas. It, it really wasn't a free flow of thought. It was, tell me what I need to know to pass the test, and that's all I want to know, because I have so many other things to do. Somebody that can translate the experiences that we have into the business vernacular would be so valuable. I can walk into an interviewer right on a resume. You know, I flew planes for five years. And it sounds great, but nobody knows what that means. You know, nobody knows what that means. Oh, well, I studied and passed oral boards and written boards and physical boards and all these other things. So somebody that can translate military experience into something that is readable and understandable on the resume would be just invaluable. I truly care about root grades. This time, I want to know. And it's sort of the big difference between this concerning yourself with just making a mark and or achieving a certain standard and actually having knowledge about the things that you're studying and understanding them with a greater perspective. And you want to learn from someone more than you can do strictly by reading and looking at uh, things online. One of the best of programs, you've been given tremendous opportunities, not only by you, but by the American people. And so you want to get more out of it. And that's why I think you're really looking for professors who are accessible, who actually can relate their knowledge to you. My experience here at AU is a little different coming from the military and I'm currently in a graduate program studying international peace and conflict resolution. So it's been a great learning opportunity for me. And one of the biggest challenges I faced directly in the classroom was working on group projects. That's the age difference, that's the difference in having previous position of responsibility and working on mission-focused projects with a tight deadline. And it was often difficult to work with people who were younger and didn't have that sense of My suggestion to faculty would be to avoid stereotyping or viewing all veterans as just veterans, but instead recognizing that they are people with a lot of background and experience to contribute to the classroom. The Marine Corps itself is a very conservative, and I would even say closed-minded organization. It does not foster everything that is not what it's designed to do. That should be what American University is designed to do. And that's what I expect to find here. And so far, I haven't found anything to contradict that. If you're a professor at AU, think about all of a sudden, instead of your normal student body, having to teach an entire student body full of veterans. Think about think about how it would be like for you if you're a professor and suddenly you know, the stereotypical veteran is what you have to teach. That's kind of what it is like for a veteran. Most of them are coming in and all that they're dealing with are these very liberal, young college you know, kids. And for the most part, probably pretty liberal group of professors. So it's a big adjustment for them. I would just say, kind of put yourself in their shoes and think of the adjustment that they're having to make and realize that it's a pretty unique adjustment. When I came to DC, I remained friendly. I would like to speak with any and everyone I could speak to who could just help enlighten me in regards to my political aspirations, my ideas for what I should expect if I go with um, school and my academic work, you're American, and so far, I think I've been pretty successful in that. Maybe sometimes more our downfalls as veterans is that we're not really sometimes exposed to academic life. I mean, going into the Army and doing some of the things that I've done or others have done, you know, we don't really have to sit down and do algebra. We don't have to sit down and write out a, a five-page essay on certain things. I would just ask professors to take time to understand that we are people who are doing the job and we will get the job done and we'll, we'll come through. Well, it actually looks like we're just about out of time, but thank you so much for such an interesting conversation and thank you to our veterans for having such a community. Um, well, and we'll be sure to put the PowerPoints and maybe even the video up on the Blackboard site so you guys can have access to that. Um, and our email should be available on the Blackboard site as well, so please reach out to all of us um, if you'd like to talk to us further. Are you allowed to show this video to students? Yes, I have released it. The other one. Great question. Oh, I will. <laughs>
Yeah, and, and also, I am available to any of you. I mean, for any questions that you have. Um, you know, one of the things that, that you had mentioned about, uh, you know, what can we do, you know, in terms of mentoring and stuff like that, when you heard the uh, female pilot, um, that is a really, really big thing. M articulating a military transcript into business is essential. They don't know how to talk their skills into something because they're so <coughs> smart and they have they have had such you know really intensive training. So you know I had one come into my office the other day and I was you know I I'm always asking questions because ultimately if I talk to them long enough I will be you know someone I know will come to mind. You know, like, I think I can introduce you to someone that was in the State Department that you can talk to about this and that or the other thing. So that's, it, it's just making those connections, the rapport. You know. So thank you guys. Again, thank you. Thank you.